Do you want to straddle? I don't know. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. I used to be a performing arts, so I'm good at projecting my voice, so I think we'll be all right. Um, now, I had a couple of presentations teed up. I actually think I'm leaning towards one in particular just because um, I had one that was more more eyes in code. I think our eyes may be a little bit tired, uh, tired at this point. Um, so what I would like to talk about today is a presentation um, that I've done before that, that is really called Rise of Serverless Applications. And this, as far as being, can you guys see that? Okay, let me just make sure that we can get full screen. So now in terms of MongoDB, I will be talking about MongoDB, but what I'd really like to talk about is the trends of the internet that has really brought about the growth of MongoDB. I'm a web developer, and I've been developing web applications for a really long time, and through my evolution as a developer, I've noticed a lot of trends that have occurred in the web that have caused radical paradigm shifts that has brought about these revolutionary new technologies, one of those being MongoDB. And so that's what I'd like to talk about, which is the rise of serverless applications. You guys have probably heard of that term. We're going to be talking about it, but we're going to be talking about the evolution of the internet which brought about these technologies such as MongoDB. Uh, I'm a big Node.js uh, guy, so Node.js, uh, uh, the mean stack. All of these things I'm going to be talking about and where they came from and why it's important and why it matters. My name is Travis Tidwell. I'm the founding CTO of Form.io. You can also find me on Software Gnome on Twitter. And I also do a lot of open source contributions. I have a GitHub account. I'm Travis T on GitHub. There you can find a lot of things that I've done. You mentioned um, uh, Node.js and Mongoose. Um, I've written a layer on top of Mongoose called Resource.js, which essentially reflects Mongoose models as REST APIs. Form.io is actually built on top of that. We're going to be talking about that a little bit. That's actually how I'm going to get started. I'm going to talk a little bit about a MongoDB case story. That MongoDB case story is us. Form.io, we are a very happy customer. And just to get started a little bit, let me talk about what Form.io is. Form.io is a, is a web application development platform that allows web application developers to drag and drop, build forms using a drag and drop interface where you can provide fields, you can provide validation criteria, you can provide all of these things that are fee, uh, forms that essentially would be embedded into your application. But the beauty of this is that this is entirely built for the serverless application uh, movement. These forms are serverless. They are founded on the principles of JSON schemas. As most of you know, JSON schemas can automatically generate REST APIs. They define a model and you go way down into the database and what do you get? You get MongoDB, which is an amazing database built on JSON schemas. This is a, this is a model driven web that we are actually moving toward and the model driven web is actually bringing about this serverless movement. And Form.io really does take advantage of this movement by pro providing a platform for developers founded on open source. We have a very robust open source offering. All of our form renderers, form builders, open source we have. But then of course, go to Form.io, create a free account. I, I, I encourage you guys to check it out. But what I'd like to talk about is why Form.io loves MongoDB. MongoDB, if you really think about it, represents the absolute core of what Form.io is built on top of. What I just showed you, what do you start with? You build a form using a drag and drop form builder. Our form builder is very special. It's not like any other, you know, WooFu or any of these other form builders you find on the market. Instead of building an HTML form, what our form builder does, in fact, I like to commonly say our form builder is a glorified JSON schema builder. That's all it does. Our form builder generates this JSON schema, which is a representation of the form. And guess what? That representation of a form, because you're dragging first name, you're dragging last name, you're dragging email, you're providing validation criteria of the form, that's what you see in the application. It puts you in the right mindset to also say, you know what? I have all the information that I need to automatically generate a REST API behind that form. All of this is based on top of the mean stack. The mean stack is, uh, in, the, in the front end is uh, Angular, although we, we uh, have libraries for React, we have uh, libraries for Angular, we have uh, other libraries as well. But once you generate this REST API, it then at that point generates the data model in MongoDB. 
So with FormIL, what you are really doing, get this, you are building MongoDB data models using a form builder. Ultimately, that's what you're doing. And what's amazing about this technology, in fact, we have a lot of our customers doing this. A lot of our customers are putting this in the hands of their customers. So get this. You can actually take our form builder, embed it into your own product, have it facing your customers, so when your customers are building their forms, they don't realize it, but they're actually building a REST API. They're also building MongoDB models. We love MongoDB. We are very much, we are very much latched on to uh, MongoDB at the hip. We love it. And MongoDB is where, where we're moving forward. In fact, all of our customers, who any, any customer that becomes a customer of Form.io becomes a customer of MongoDB. I want to make sure that's very clear. But we're not here to talk about us. What we're here to talk about is what our company represents, which is actually that there's this massive paradigm shift that is occurring in the, in the web development community. This paradigm shift actually has occurred fairly recently. For those of you who have been web developers and developers probably for, let's say, uh, five years or more have actually been experiencing this. But what has actually happened is there's been a massive fracturing of the web development community and how applications are being built. And a number of technologies are rising because of this. These technologies, if you actually go to Google Trends, you'll actually see a little bit of a trend going on here. The very top left is serverless. The top right is React. The top bottom left is the mean stack. REST API is in the bottom right. And of course, the one we love is MongoDB. We are, see we are seeing a trend that is happening that is not going away. And actually, what's, in, what's occurring is very much an inflection point that has occurred in the web. And it's caused a major differentiation of how web applications are being built. And there's a serverless, what's being called a serverless movement is being brought about that. And it's also bringing massive adoption to the technologies that adhere to this new trend. MongoDB is one of them. So we have all these trends. And as developers like to say, we've had these three major paradigm shifts in the history of the web. In fact, it's really... It's almost beneficial to kind of take a step backward, to kind of say, okay, where have we come from? Where are we now? Let's talk about it, because once you actually take a step backward and walk through the evolution of the web, it becomes very clear what is going on here. There's been three major paradigm shifts in the history of the web. And being developers, we love giving them version numbers. <laughs> the first one we like to call Web 1.0. This is the static web. And if we talk about it, let's say, okay, whenever the web was first introduced, what we actually had was the browser on the right. And every time that you would go to a website, whenever you would go into your browser, you would type in double www, back then it was what, geocities.com? You would type in your favorite website, geocities.com, you would hit enter. That would actually go through the internet, that would hit a server. And you were hitting a URL that had, a, had an index.html on there. What the server would actually do is the server would go look in its file directory. And it would find that file called index.html, and it says, ah, there's the file. It was, an, it was an HTML file. And it would send that file to the user in the HTML format, and that would render in the user's browser, and they would actually see the web page. That and was flashy web. text. And flashy text, GIFs, yes. <laughs> Although GIFs have come back. Everything comes back, you know? It's only a matter of time before we go back to this. And actually, Marquees. If, if you guys stay with me towards the end, you will see that we are coming back to where we started. Yeah. Right, we're going to get there in a minute. So from this movement, what actually happened is developers got a little bit clever. They said, you know what, whenever this request hits the server, I have control here. I can actually write some clever language. In fact, I'm going to use this horrid language called PHP, and I'm going to write some, I actually used to write PHP. I actually love it. Don't, please don't get me wrong. I'm, I used to be a Drupal developer. I love PHP. Uh, but since I moved on to Node, I'm never going back. Um, so basically, what these developers would do is they would actually write these templates. And they would say, once the request makes it our way, we can do some clever things. We can actually generate the template based on who this person is. And, and then we can also do some other clever stuff. We can latch onto a SQL database. Really, SQL is all we had back in the day. And we could actually generate this HTML using these PHP templates, render the form, and then send that back to the user. But the, the point that I'm trying to make here is even in this scenario, the server was sending HTML back to the user. It's a very important, but we called it the dynamic web. We loved it. It was a wonderful thing. But then out of this, out of this 
this system, even more clever developers said, you know what, we can actually make frameworks out of this. We can make it so that users can generate their own content. And through this actually came the rise of the CMSs. The, the rise of the CMSs came about through, the, through this, this notion that you can actually provide a framework to developers, but not just developers, you can provide a framework to publishers, to all these types of people, to generate their own content and actually put those inside of these, these databases. And then it's wonderful. People can author their own content, they can save it, that content goes into the database. But what's important to note here is even in this world, the world that we all know and love today, by the way, this is still the majority of the internet. Even in this world, when I go and I hit index.html on this website, it goes to the server. The server then goes down to this, to the, the, to the uh, engine. The, that goes into the CMS system. I come from the world of Drupal. Um, Drupal CMS is struggling with serverless right now, by the way. It's a massive contention in the, in the community. That then goes to PHP. That renders some templates. That gets the database. And then that sends back the interface to the user. So what you end up getting is whenever you type in a website, that actually renders the HTML from the server. And life was good. <laughs> life has been good for a really long time, guys. You let me remember this. This had like uh, whenever CMSs came around, that was probably early early 2000s, and I would say for a really good solid seven years, life was good. Then this happened. <laughs> so what happened here? And I actually do attribute this to the iPhone. I lived through it. I remember this happening because what actually what iPhone did is they did something revolutionary. They allowed you to browse the internet in a different interface than a computer. And back whenever the iPhone came out, I was just this poor developer, you know, at my keyboard. I didn't have the money to go out and buy an iPhone, but my boss did. My boss went out and bought an iPhone. He goes in there and he picks up this shiny new iPhone and all the developers in here can relate to this. He goes and he pulls up, what's the first thing that a boss of a company, a web company does whenever he buys a new shiny toy? Goes to his own website. He's going to go to his own website. <laughs> and he goes to his own website, he's like, ah, yes, I love this thing, I'm going to pull it up. And he, this looks like utter crap. <laughs> Suddenly, every single developer had a problem. And it was instantaneous. Every developer had a problem and the problem was, is that no more were people experiencing the web through a single interface. They had other devices in which they were actually experiencing the web. And so what, what came about this? In fact, a lot of developers churned on their ideas and were like, what are we gonna do? We're, what are we gonna do? We're, we're gonna, we gotta solve this problem. I got an idea. When you build a website, you need to build it what? Five times. Once. What? <laughs> Once. <laughs> Every time I give this presentation, people blurt out the right answer. You guys totally failed me this time. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's totally fine. Mobile first. Oh, yeah. Mobile first. If you're going to build a website, you need to build it mobile first. But what is mobile first? Mobile first is when you take a website and you make it so that it scrunches up and it looks really good and, and makes it look good on mobile devices. And this is what we came up with. If you're going to build an app, build it mobile first. In fact, that is, that is still the mantra of the developer today. Build it mobile first. It's a good mantra, but it's no longer good enough. And we're going to talk about that. And the reason why is because even in mobile first, a lot of people don't realize this. Nothing has really changed as far as the structure is concerned. Even in mobile first, over there on the right hand side, that mobile device is sending a request to the server. The server is then going to a CMS, churning, creating a template that is responsive, but the server is still building the template. That server then sends a responsive template back over to the client, the client renders it, and the client says, ah, it looks great. Life was good. Life was actually really good for a while uh, with mobile first. And a lot of you remember that. That's been from like 2008 until to probably about four years ago. Because then this happened. What's happened 
is that no more can we say that an actual interface is what's communicating with our backend server. In fact, I would actually go as far to say that, a, that machine communication by far outranks us even today. Human communication. They're just way more fast at it. A human can't just click and hit a server that quickly. So what ends up happening here is actually your web server falls to the least common denominator. And what I mean by that is I used to work for a company that actually went through this transition. And during this period, we were like, oh, what are we going to do to solve this problem? I know what we're going to do. We're going to just attach these little things called REST APIs to our current CMS. And these people are going to go through these current APIs and they're, they're going to get, and then pretty soon you have spaghetti code, but you also have multiple entrances to your, your platform causing massive problems. And out of that came the solution, came the serverless movement. So what serverless is about is the solution for this new web, which is API driven. And these servers need to no longer be talking to interfaces. They need to be talking to all kinds of devices. And through that has come the serverless movement. In order to really understand what serverless is about, let's take a look at what a common serverless structure actually looks like. And MongoDB is in here. So a serverless application really consists of the application ruling its world. Where you have partials, you have the, the uh, uh, I'm a big Angular guy, but we got guys on our team that are React guys. I mean, it's, there's all kinds of front end frameworks that can build wonderful applications. But the point is, is that it, controls its world as far as the application is concerned, even with offline mode. And it only communicates to the server via this thing called the REST API. Once it hits to the REST API, it then hits my favorite thing called Node.js. And then from Node.js, it can then talk to the MongoDB database. And what you then at that point have is a what's called a mean stack web application. And it's eating the world right now. The, the idea of mean is eating the world, not the technical technology of mean. What's great about this type of architecture is this is a serverless type of application structure that allows you to scale. We're going to talk about why it allows you to scale, why it allows you to talk to any type of device, any type of interface. And from that point, you are basically have jumped over the chasm. I like to talk about that this web 2.0 to web 3.0 has quite literally been a chasm. Dev shops who have basically anchored themselves into the CMS world and to, these, uh, to the back-end systems, back-end heavy systems, have found themselves in a very, very hard time to shift and throw themselves over this chasm in which they can actually become serverless. That's actually, for those of you who want to check it out, Form.io helps out a lot with that. A lot of you also say, why the name serverless? It seems to be somewhat of a misnomer. Doesn't the app still use a server? I mean, a server, you would think that a serverless app is an app that doesn't need a server. And for those people who say that, I commonly like to use this, this phrase. Serverless does not mean your application does not need a server. It means your application has been liberated from the server. A lot of those previous applications where you have web 2.0, these applications are being rendered on the server. And once you render an HTML on the server, that HTML is now handcuffed to that server. And it's really hard to separate it. Really hard. What serverless does is it draws a hard line and says, no, the application is an application. The server is a server. They can only talk to each other via REST APIs. Therefore, the app has been liberated from the server. It is serverless. I also hear this a lot. My app is mobile first. Am I serverless? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> Almost resoundingly, though, every time I talk to somebody, the answer is no. If they're asking that question. Because, a lot of, because in order to be serverless, there's one massive like, criteria. There's one test. And if you fail this test, you are not serverless. If your server ever sends HTML to the client, so you are not serverless, period. That's the test. HTML belongs in the client. Data models, REST APIs belong in the server. And I also like to say that mobile first is no longer good enough. We need a new term. 
The term I like to anchor to is, and also, and I explained this, the reason why mobile first isn't good enough is because it, the server is still spit, uh, sending the templates. But the term that I'd like to anchor to is API first. The way that API first works is you actually focus on your REST API platform first, which includes Mongo. There's, there's a, a lot of wonderful libraries out there. I actually wrote a library. I have a really popular mean stack video on YouTube where I actually use a library called Resource.js, which takes Mongo, Mongoose models. It takes Mongoose models and reflects those as, as REST APIs. That actually classifies as a REST API that sits directly on top of Mongo. Your REST platform also must be stateless. What does that mean? We'll talk a little bit about this later, but stateless basically means, it doesn't mean that your, your app can't have state, meaning like users can't have like their login or keep track of like a wizard flow. All it means is the server is no longer responsible for state. The state has to be handled by the app through the use of commonly JWT tokens, that's what we use at Form.io. They're wonderful technology that actually keeps all of your state within a, within a token form so that by the time it's sent to the server, it's de decrypted, it's a digitally signed so you can verify it, and then that actually provides the state to the server. Another thing I like to say is that your first app should not be an app. Your first app should be a test. Uh, we use Mocha. At Formio, and a thing called Super Tests. It's remarkably easy, and you can actually build what's essentially an app, hitting your APIs to ensure that it's rock solid. And then once you do that, you now can be rest assured that you can build an app on top of those APIs. And then that's what I'm saying here: your serverless app is built on those. So why serverless? Well, serverless actually forces us to build websites like web applications. A lot of people use those interchangeably. I don't because I would like to reserve web apps to mean that these are standalone applications. If you build sites that exist on the server, those are websites. Let's talk a little bit about the benefits of serverless. One is the separation of concerns. Like we mentioned before, the client is responsible for its application, the server is responsible for the API, MongoDB is responsible for the data models. Again, if you use Form.io, these all become one beautiful, harmonious thing. <laughs> Just to throw it out there. <laughs> Another thing is scalability. With Form, with, <laughs> with, you do get scalability with Form.io. With uh, serverless applications, you have this remarkable ability to scale your applications because now you can deploy your applications anywhere. Um, it's very common to now deploy applications on, on a CloudFront, a CDN, to where your applications are no longer on a server, they're actually in a CDN. It used to be where CDNs were reserved for images and videos. Now you can use the CDN to host the entire app. And it sends serverless REST APIs to an elastic load balancer, and because those are stateless REST APIs, it just forwards along the API request to any server, it doesn't matter, because servers don't care about state. Because of that, the ELB, the Elastic Load Balancer, can actually send requests to any server and it does not matter. And then finally that goes into, uh, this, is, this is an old slide, I would have changed it out for MongoDB, but we actually at, at Form.io use MongoDB, that goes to the MongoDB servers on the back end. Could, could that cloud, cloud front be something like Akamai or something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. A lot of people don't realize that S3, Amazon S3, they're like, oh, that's that file storage thing, right? I can put my files there. We host all of our apps on Amazon S3. Hmm. You put them on an S3 bucket. You put CloudFront in front of it. Now you have worldwide distribution of your application so that people in China, when they go to your website, they hit enter. It does not, that request does not travel the globe to hit your server, and then your server builds the template sends the request all the way around the globe again to give the person their app. The app is immediately available, hitting a server right next to it because it's, it's hosted via CDN. How about deployment? Deployment is so easy. We actually, uh, you can actually take advantage of Docker, we have Docker containers, we actually have Formio use Docker containers to actually build our REST APIs so that you can deploy them in your own environment, hook it up to your own database, MongoDB database, and that way you can control all of your data. And through that Docker container, you can actually easily deploy these, these uh, servers. 
And another thing that's great, you see this thing called auto scaling. Yep. Auto scaling is only possible if your API servers are what's called ephemeral. Ephemeral means that they can be thrown away and brought in at any time. They, they don't last very long. You get the ability to create ephemeral scaling whenever you go to serverless. You cannot do this if you are not serverless. The reason is, is because every single server has to maintain the state. Every server is responsible for building a template. You may be throwing out a server right, right whenever it's actually serving a client and that client's viewing a page. And this, whenever they hit submit to order that million dollar product of yours, it's going to fail because you threw away the server behind their backs. You don't have that problem whenever you're using this type of uh, system. What made you to choose uh, MongoDB instead of DynamoDB? Uh, a lot of it had to do with the flexibilities that we had with generating these REST APIs that sit on top of it. So MongoDB and through their, uh, through their community, as well as their community offerings, has allowed us to build a bunch of libraries that sit on top of it, that auto-generate REST APIs, and through the auto-generation of REST APIs, we took it one step further by saying that a form builder could build the REST APIs, and that became a stack that we heavily depend on. So MongoDB is very intrinsic to, to what we've done. Are y'all using Kubernetes to do your scaling and stuff? We are just Docker. I mean, we don't we don't use Kubernetes. But it's actually all of our scaling right now. We do in AWS. We use Elastic Beanstalk is what we use in, in AWS. And Elastic Beanstalk has auto scaling. It just throws away and adds servers as we need it. Another thing that a lot of people don't think about with serverless is deployability. Whenever your app is handcuffed to the server, you cannot compile it as a Cordova mobile application. You, as I mentioned before, you can't put it on Amazon S3. You have CloudFront. Smart TVs now support where you can build an app and, and uh, applications put them on a smart TV. Electron, you guys saw, I just saw uh, Mongo Compass. I, I, could, I would bet money that that was built in Electron. I would build, I'd bet money on it. I bet it was. Um, you can't do that if you have these apps handcuffed to the server. Another thing is offline mode. A lot of people see this slide and they smirk saying, why is offline mode still a thing? I actually think offline mode is going to become more of a thing in the future for the reason is, is a lot of people mistake or, or uh, think of offline as being no internet. Offline means off premise. There's a lot of medical companies in which you are, once you're on, in network, you are now in their system. The second you leave, you are no longer connected to their system. Offline mode becomes very important for those type of applications because these people go home and they still need to be able to use their apps and they can't if their app is hosted in network. We can go on to a little bit of how much time do we have. I can go into how serverless works, but how much time do I have? Where are we good? Any about 10 minutes? Dorothy, how are we in time? Seven. Seven minutes? I, I can do this in seven minutes because this is interesting. At least I think it's interesting. It's like, I'm not allowed to talk about this at my dinner table because my wife disallows it. <laughs> I find it interesting. Um, so anyway, serverless apps, a lot of people see this and they're like, how in the world is this a good thing? Um, but I want to talk about it. Because this is the first negative, all the naysayers of serverless will bring this up. That now you have this application that's hosted and, and for every single section it's sending off a separate REST API request to actually get the data it needs to populate that. And a lot of the naysayers say, how in the world is that better than this? Where you have this web 3.0 application that's actually sending off maybe possibly 20 requests per page to the server versus one single request where I can get everything I need. How is that better? That's the biggest, biggest complaint about serverless and I'm about to dip it in the butt. <laughs> Let's actually inspect what's going on with the Web 2.0 request. I come from Drupal, so if any of you guys come from Drupal, this will, this will hit at home. With a typical Web 2.0 request, that client, which is the browser, sends a request to the server. If you're running PHP, PHP does not have a pre-bootstrap process like Node.js does, so it has to go through a bootstrap process. This actually includes restoring your user session. So you've got your cookie, it sends off a request to the database to restore the user. It then bootstraps some caching and all of this type of stuff. You have a bootstrap process. After that, it says, okay, what page are they on? Okay, this page has like 
like 200 things on it. So I need at that point to hit the database 200 times. And so what it does is it bounces back and forth. This server goes about back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it's a bunch of, it hits the database a bunch of times before it even sends the response back to the client. And if you're a Mongo guy, this, this is your, your MongoDB getting hammered every single request. That's what happens. Your Mongo database is getting hammered for every request. And how do you scale with this? I came from a company where we tried to scale. What do you do? You buy a bigger server. That's how you scrunch that. And your, 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 your objective, really, at that point is to scrunch it. Right? I'm just going to scrunch this as tight as I can. And then if I get 100 people hitting me at once, then I'm screwed. You can't scale. And the reason is, is because every single request is killing your server. The way Web 3.0 works is every request is atomic. It's resource-based re uh, APIs. And what that means is a single API is not getting a bunch of content. A single API is maybe getting a single Mongo record. So you hit an API that does, that does a single Mongo database request. It sends what you need for that single API. Your app may send 50 of them. It doesn't matter because you've got a bunch of ephemeral servers spun up that are ready to take those requests. They basically go parallel. And because you're serverless, they each one of them take the thing. They hit the database. You end up, and actually this, is, this has been tested, you end up getting higher performance than you would a Web 2.0 application. And not only that, but these things could be Raspberry Pis, mm -hmm. and you could have a million of them, and your site could handle traffic from Facebook. You can scale, and it makes a difference. Another really important thing is stateless. I've talked a little bit about stateless, but because of that, that request can go to any server it wants to. It doesn't. It's not latched onto a single server. And that server now has to serve that request. If you use JWT tokens, I would write that down. That is the key to scaling. JWT tokens, token-based authentication allows you to scale and resolves a lot of the problems of state, like restoring user states, and, and uh, is very widely successful for us. Bonus question, how do you pronounce the JWT? JWT tokens. <laughs> I call them JVC because I'm an old school, old, old <laughs> fart. Uh, there's also a lot of application frameworks at your disposal. We have Angular, we have uh, React, Vue is becoming very popular these days, Ionic, Amber, Aurelia. Over here is a, is a thing called um, a Polymer uh, using web components, very, very popular, it's uh, great. And then of course I talk a little bit about how single page applications work. I'm going to skip over this just because you can read up on this. It's very intriguing on uh, how these, these apps work. And one thing I did want to talk about is you're actually flipping the, flipping the pancake here a little bit. Uh, typical, typical web apps, like in CMSs. I remember back in the day when I was dealing with the CMS, and I'd have a customer come to me and be like, yeah, I need a Twitter feed on my website. And any Drupal developer, what they would do is they would go enable a module. They would go find the module called the Twitter module. They would enable it, and that would give Twitter capabilities to their website. That is backwards. The reason why that's backwards is there is no reason why a back-end module should be responsible for a front-end thing. Once you go serverless, your app controls its world. And what that means is if you need to bring Twitter into your application, just bring Twitter into the application, use an embed, and you, you're, you're, you're happy. It doesn't require the server. And so what ends up happening is now because now your, your server is not responsible for everything. Your server is only responsible for what it does. And this is bringing about a thing called microservices. You are turning your system into a microservice all backed by MongoDB. And it will help us go from what used to be this, where you have this one-to-one -one connection between these apps to these servers, to something that looks a little bit more like this, where every app can talk to any server, and any server can talk to any app, creating this wide mesh network of communication and really, in a lot of ways, this is taking the web back to where it started. So and it's a good thing. So what's the difference between microservice and a REST, REST API? So microservices use REST APIs. Yeah. It's, uh, what you're doing is every single connection to a server is a REST API, but instead of the app requiring your server to deliver all of the goods for that app, 
that app can talk to all kinds of things that it needs to. In fact, if you look at this, this right here, it can talk to Twitter, it can talk to Google Maps. Form.io is actually in the mix here. If you need forms in your serverless app, embed a Form.io form there, and it, it becomes its own thing. Does, does this make the, the, the app heavy if once you embed all of those on the, on the client side? Uh, no more heavy than it would be if you were on a CMS. The app definitely does. So Travis, you're talking to customers and developers all over the world. And they're a lot like people sitting in this room. And they're solving very specific problems. And much of what you're talking about is next gen. It's new. It's all of what you, the way you presented it. How do they react to MongoDB in that conversation? How do they react to MongoDB? Yeah, how do you how do you present it? How do they react? And how do they go to work and say this is the proposal, the solution that I'm going to pursue? Not only for your favorite thing, Formio, but also for Formio with Mongo being part of that. I think that that MongoDB, as a JSON-based database, schemaless database, it it captures all the wonderful things about serverless architectures in that it is scalable. These are flexible schemas that can represent any form of data and can talk to anything and represent any type of thing. So forms sitting on top of that can represent any type of data model. I think that may get close to what you were asking, but maybe you had a different idea. No, that's exactly what I was asking. And it's my sense that you don't find a lot of market resistance to the proposal that MongoDB provides the flexibility and capabilities that you need to deliver for my own. MongoDB has formed the absolute base of our platform. It is, it is, and in fact, whenever, because um, it, it, could, it could be said, I actually, we have a lot of people on our team now, a lot of very talented people on our team now, but very, in the very early days, I built for my own by starting with MongoDB. I started with this amazing technology called MongoDB. From there, I took it one step further, auto-generated REST APIs based on Mongo models. And because I was entrenched in forms day in, day out, I said, you know what, you could use a form builder to build these, these, these schemas. And so I built a form builder that sits on top of those. And what you ended up getting was a form builder that built REST APIs, but at the bottom of all of it, and what started it all was MongoDB. But it'll work with other databases too. This, Formio will not. <laughs> Formio, you have to have MongoDB. It's, you're, you're absolutely right, but you have to pair this slide with the previous slide. What this slide says is that your server is no longer responsible for everything. You're turning it into a microservices structure. By turning it into a microservices structure, the database is no longer responsible for everything. So therefore, if you need to get everything into your app, this request doesn't even go to your server. 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 There might be a few that only go to your Mongo database. These requests are not database That's why it's not going to They're not what? These requests are not database Of course they are. Every one of these requests could be backed up by a Mongo database. So even if I have 2.0, for putting this data, I will not be getting my own database server. I will be getting this server. No, it, it, the, the, typical, the typical Web 2.0 pattern, it really was a pattern. You could build a web app in Web 2.0 that does this. The problem is, is all of the frameworks do not enable you to do that. All of the frameworks have taught you as a developer that if you want Twitter into your application and you're on Drupal, you have to go and install the, mo the Twitter module, which is a back-end module that hits that database to do lookups to say, okay, what's their Twitter ID? Here's the person, what's their Twitter ID? That is a hit to the database. I guess what I'm trying to say here is, what we're doing is we're moving to a model in which you create scalability, in which every request can be scaled. I also, I, I didn't have an opportunity to introduce the, the gentleman in the back, that's, that's my, uh, our CEO of Formio, his name is Gary Wetzel, so if you have a chance to go talk to him, he's a, a fascinating guy, so go talk to him. Thanks Gary for your, your comment earlier. Very briefly, I'll add to that, and thank you for that. I'll say this, from a business perspective, 
you know, we talk a lot about the technical issues right here, but we provide very enabled solutions to the marketplace, and they're new. And people are trying to solve new solutions. And one thing I appreciate about this presentation and uh, our relationship with Mago is that it's part of an enabling solution. That's the point I was trying to make. And very rarely, whether it's in New Zealand or Australia or in South Africa or UK or Ireland or here, uh, is it an obstacle? It's uh, when you partner with somebody, it's highly relevant to be able to stand by their ability to solution, as well as all the innovative stuff that Travis was trying to start the first time. And I do want to just acknowledge that, that that's part of it. I, I wanted to bring that out a little bit, was how does that play out? Because all of the elements of that stack are relevant. And they're relevant, we have a lot of unique capabilities ourselves, for sure, but they're enabled also by that capability. Well, and actually, you, you use the word stack. Our stack underneath it all is MongoDB. And as for Myo, that'll never change. We, we're very happy to be on MongoDB. We've been a very happy customer. So that's it for me, guys. That's the presentation. Thank you guys so much.